Welcome, Remake Learning. Welcome back to another Thursday conversation for Remake Tomorrow. We will get started in just a few short minutes, a few short seconds, actually. As always, a couple of comfort notes as we wait to get started. The session will be recorded and we will post it to the Remake Learning YouTube channel early next week. We encourage you to use Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube to comment and ask questions. We would love to respond to you as time allows. And if you've never done so before, please visit remakelearning.org slash join to review our network norms and values. We don't go through them on Thursday conversations. A few other body ten things to attend to. If you have not had water in the last hour or so, this is a perfect opportunity to get up and hydrate. If you have not stood or looked away from your computer, let's pause and take a moment to look away from our machines and take a moment to breathe. And with that, Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Tomorrow, a campaign powered by Remake Learning. For those less familiar with our work, Remake Learning is a network dedicated to igniting more relevant, engaging, and equitable learning experiences in a time of rapid technological change. We know that no single organization, project, or person can do the transformative work of moving our education system forward. And so Remake Learning exists to bring them all together. If you ever wanna learn more about our work or how to get involved, you can contact me or our info ad account, which I will share in just a moment. As we move through and beyond pandemics in 2020 and into a post-pandemic future, Remake Learning offers a space to consider how we might work in better relationship with each other while staying grounded in timeless and innovative methods of teaching and learning, while attending to the justice needed for us to move teaching, learning, and society forward. We welcome you to continue the conversation, to continue to question, and to continue to wonder along with us now through October 20th and beyond, as we ask what can we do today to make tomorrow a more promising place for all learners. Learn more at remakelearning.org tomorrow. We hope that you will connect with us now and into the future on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and at our info ad account and share on social media using hashtag remake tomorrow. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce our guests this week, Dr. June Lei Li and Dr. Dana Winters, who I am going to add to the stream. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Dr. June Lei Li is the Saul Zant Zant Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Forgive my stammer. And Dr. Dana Winters is the Faculty and Academic Director of Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning and Children's Media at St. Vincent College. Together, they partner on the work of Simple Interactions, an approach to noticing and affirming human relationships and interactions in child and youth serving settings. Welcome so much. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you, um, Moni. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I know we have had folks tuning in and dialing in from as far away as Finland, so it's great to have uh, neighbors just just close to us and just further away in Massachusetts joining us. Um, thank you. So as I mentioned, usually we kick these conversations off like straight off the jump, but I wanted to take a moment to do a little bit of grounding work given the depth of the knowledge that you're bringing into the space as it's related to the Tomorrow Campaign, which has been, since its very uh, conceptualization, grounded in the timeless teachings of Fred Rogers. And so those timeless sensibilities of who we lovingly refer to as America's favorite neighbor had brought together researchers, educators, and counselors 
to further children's learning while preparing them for the struggles and joys of being human, right? And it was complicated by the fact that he was using this new technology called television in order to do that. So as a starting off place, can you talk a little bit about your relationship to the legacy and the teachings of Mr. Fred Rogers? Um, sure. Uh, so, you know, the, the legacy and teachings of, of Mr. Rogers is, uh, I guess, one of those big broad starting points. And um, I think interestingly, Jinlay and I both have um, some similarities in how we came to know Fred's work. Uh, I grew up in the Pittsburgh area and was familiar with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, um, but didn't necessarily watch it as a child. However, came to know Fred's work um, as an adult, as a mom, as a researcher, as a practitioner. And um, that has given me a, a, a very different kind of depth of, of understanding to Fred's work and how it applies and extends to our situations today and beyond. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I was born in China, so um, I had no idea who uh, Fred uh, Rogers was, but uh, I was in Pittsburgh for graduate school and um, studying child development and then on some days when I'm not going to class, I watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood as a full grown-up, and um, and it was just so so. I think it was just so incredibly powerful the the way he talked about children's development and human development. And it was until years later when I worked at the Fred uh, uh, Rogers Center that, that mm -hmm. as I start to take Fred's ideas and messages not only you know to other parts of our region, but to the country, even to other countries, to my home country. Um, that was when I think I really realized that some of the, the ideas he was talking about, uh, while it may be rooted in the neighborhood of Pittsburgh, it, it really resonated with people kind of all over the world, um, people who have never grown up uh, with the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm curious to know wh where you see that sort of Fred method or Fred magic showing up because one of the things that we talk about internally to remake learning is that that legacy is part of the secret sauce of why something like the remake learning network can exist in a place like Southwestern PA or in Northern West Virginia. It has that sort of legacy to it. Do you see that in other places? I think that's one of the, most beautiful parts of Fred's work, and Jinlay touched upon it, is that while it is so firmly rooted in child development, it extends beyond child development to human development. That so much of what Fred talked about through Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, what he wrote about, what he gave to us in speeches and letters, extends beyond childhood. Um, that while we feel it deeply and it's something that is so very meaningful in the lives of children still it's something as adults that we can continue to think about and as grown-ups even if we aren't directly working in service of children these are ideas and philosophies that extend far beyond just child development um, and especially in in times that we're facing right now i think that they are not only words of comfort, but also words that can help us to re-engage with the foundation of what he was promoting uh, it, through his, his program, through his writings, through his teachings. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and when we had been prepping for this conversation, one of the things that came up as those evergreen human development pieces we're thinking about not just child development as you're explaining, but thinking about how, how might we invest in something like trust or self-worth or play, curiosity or solitude. I think, I think that I'm missing one of the, <laughs> one of the key components, if, if you can gap fill for me. Um, but can you talk more about like where that comes from, how that shows up in, in the practices and in the, in the research? Sure. So those um, are concepts that were taken from um, Mr. Rogers' Talks with Parents, which was a book that, that Fred um, co-authored, I believe in 1983, that talks about concepts of learning readiness. 
And uh, Fred framed these concepts of learning readiness as um, number one, a sense of self-worth, number two, a sense of trust, number three, curiosity, four, the capacity to look and listen carefully, five, the capacity to play, and six, times of solitude. Mm -hmm. So even now, those, uh, those concepts are, are very different than how we would think of learning readiness or school readiness in an academic focused way. But these are six things that um, I know I haven't mastered, uh, that's for sure. And you know, we all have been in faced with all six of those in many different ways over the last eight months also. Um, but I think you know, Jinlei and I have been talking at length about what these things mean for the, the continuing notions of education and learning today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how might we how might we get to a place where we're investing in those in a in a more academic space or an academic way? Well I think one of the things that I find resonating um, not only in the Pittsburgh neighborhood, but when we take uh, these ideas kind of, you know, across the country and around the world is Fred's insistence that whatever we do, so we might be a teacher, we might be a speaker, we might be an artist, musician, whatever it is that we do, we try to speak to what Fred called the deepest needs of human beings, whether these human beings are five-year-olds, 15-year-olds, or 85-year-olds. And Dana was listing, you know, what Fred thought were the things that helps a child be ready for learning. But those are the things, as Dana said, would be important for all of us at any age for our learning and development. Let me just pick one of them, the top one, right? So Fred often put, you know, he intentionally put self-worth as the first thing, right? Self-worth, in my understanding from Fred's writings and program, isn't just about being full of yourself. <laughs> we know there are a lot of people who are quite full of themselves at the moment. But um, Fred, um, Fred gave a speech um, in October, the year before he died. Um, and the speech was called Something Worth Giving. And um, in the first line of the speech, I still remember, um, he writes, each and every one of us longs to know that there's something about us that's worth giving. Mm. And, and that to me was very much at the core of what Fred meant by self-worth. And he, of course, tried to convey that through his program and so on. But if we move beyond the program, we just think, okay, so if I'm a teacher, right? No matter what age I teach, like there's a lot that, you know, I have books, I have curriculums, there's a lot of things I want to show the kids. But what is it, how do I do it in such a way that, that, that the children in my classroom feel like they have something worth giving? Not only to me, not only to each other, but to the subject, right? Are they there to just receive the subject or do they have something worth giving? And you can extend that simple question, right? to just about every sphere of human development and professional work and go, well, how do I do this in such a way that helps someone else feel like they have something worth giving? Um, and, and there are countless Fred ideas that are like that, 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 that you can just take it from context to context and context and just kind of reflect upon and question ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm, my wheels are turning because I warned you that these are highly conversational panels that we have here on Thursdays. And one thing that makes me feel hearing you describe that is this deep sense of urgency that the helpers have felt this year to be able to contribute, coupled with an idea that I've been exploring in some of the learning communities that I'm part of that are focused on social change and racial justice, that so much of that work is often comes down to self-examination. And I wonder, I wonder what those teachings could help us couple, um, knowing and hearing what I've heard you both say about those humanizing experiences, that humanizing interactions, they, there's a, a choice that can be a humanizing interaction or a dehumanizing interaction, right? 
that's a little all over the place if, if you'll forgive me, but if you could respond to that in any way. Uh, so you're absolutely right that every interaction has the power and the ability to be either humanizing or dehumanizing. Uh, and sometimes just that statement alone can put an awful lot of pressure on all of us as helpers and those of us who are trying to advance these ideals. Um, one thing that I have found deeply comforting from uh, if you know we're, we're looking at Fred Rogers ideas and thinking mm -hmm. is his um, idea that we don't have to be perfect in order to be effective in some of these conversations. And as we continue in helping and continue along a path that uh, none of us expected, and I think so much of us are trying to find the most helpful ways forward, I think it's helpful to remember that we don't have to be perfect in that, but we've got to be trying. And in it, you know, when, when Fred tells us that we all have something worth giving and he tells us that each one of us wants to know that we are loved and capable of loving and that there is a welcome for us in this world, these are ideas of self-worth that transcend childhood. Mm -hmm. These are ideals of self-worth that we can all work toward regardless of what we do for a living, regardless mm -hmm. of who it is that we serve, that we can build that type of relationship with others in very small, simple moments and in the bigger moments too. Um, that sometimes it is as simple as um, you know, reaching out and being intentional about checking in with one another. Um, when we think about the, the conversations around um, social justice and anti-racism, it's again that those conversations are challenging for us, but they are worth having. Mm -hmm. And anything worth having is worth trying. And we don't have to be perfect in order to try. Um, but we've got to get into those conversations to have them. And do you think that simple interactions is a portal for people to, to, see, to see that in their practice? I think that simple interactions gives people uh, a chance to step back and be reflective of what that process looks like. Mm -hmm. um, to think about what it means to connect with another person, to think about what it means to have interactions that are inclusive of everyone who needs to be and should be a part of those interactions, mm -hmm. interactions that provide opportunities to grow, whether that be in learning or in social emotional skill, it, the possibilities are endless. But I think simple interactions gives us a lens and a language to think about the meaning of the simplest, smallest moments, and now how those contribute to those dehumanizing and humanizing relationships. I think one of the things that Dana and I have been talking uh, ever since the start of the pandemic um, has been about like, what does it mean to take a big idea, right? About humanizing and dehumanizing and take it to the simplest, most ordinary moments uh, in our day when we're with another human being, whether over a screen or in person, right? And one of the lessons that we drew from um, Fred's work is his conviction that what it means to be a human being is that to know that you as well as well as your neighbor, right, is is always going to be far far more than just one thing. And 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 I think part of dehumanization, right, is to reduce the richness of a human being to one particular attribute. Of course, um, you know, you have skin color and, and, and race, but, you know, regardless of which side of um, the adult dramas that, that we stand on, political affiliation. I mean, how, how many of us feel so strongly against people simply because of their political aff affiliation that seem to be polar opposite of us? Mm -hmm. And I think part of Big Fred, uh, Part of the big point that Fred will often make to children as well as to, to grown-ups is how do we see people as more than one thing? And, and I think to do that, we almost simultaneously have to start by seeing ourselves as mm -hmm. more than one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and part of the simple interactions work, I think, you know, what Dana was talking about, the reflection, is we would like to 
facilitate the process or provide the kind of tools that allow people to reflect on their interactions with other people, particularly children, but it can extend to other people as well, to see that what are all the different ways in which we are showing up in our interaction. And, 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 and what are all the different ways that our showing up is now connected to the needs or the deeper needs of the person that we're with. And, and I think part of that reflection not only helps us to think about interactions, it helps us to see ourselves and the person we're with as more than whatever that one thing is that we might have catalog logged them into. A, a colder way that we could talk about this is really like looking at the data, right? As a, it's a very humanized way of just examining data and information, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of the things that I've been most eager to talk to you about in this space was the question that came up when we were talking months and months ago around this idea of what is it that children are learning about adults this year. It was very present for us months ago. I'm wondering what were your thoughts then? How have they evolved since then? Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, one of the the most foundational things that I that children are learning from adults right now is that it's okay not to know all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much uncertainty, and none of us knows exactly what will be coming next. And as we work through those feelings with children and we're able to give voice to them and talk about them um, and express that we're not quite sure what's going to happen next, but that the most important thing is that we have um, you know, someone next to us to, to help us through that. And for children, that means in, in Fred's terms, the trusted adult and making sure that that trusted adult can can help to guide through the uncertainty, to be there um, when that uncertainty comes round and round. Um, but I think that's a, a really incredible lesson for children to learn, is that the not knowing is okay, and that sometimes the generation of more questions is more important than the generation of easy answers. I think, one of the things I think and I hope that children are having an opportunity to learn about the adults around them, particularly during um, the kind of global pandemic as well as the global kind of anti-racism protests, is that the grown-ups around them care about things that are bigger than, than themselves. That, that, that as parents and teachers and neighbors, as, as, as people get involved, even simple acts of you know, putting on a mask, right? You're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for something bigger than yourself. You're doing it for the neighbor and for the neighborhood. And, and, and when families talk about you know, history, when families talk about having to understand you know, the history of our own families or the history of our own country differently. Mm -hmm. um, they're showing that they care about something bigger than themselves. And, and, and I think that perhaps is something that Fred always hoped for, <laughs> that, 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 that he hoped through his program as well as any kind of good program uh, in, in any kind of media outlets is, is what happens when we walk away from that screen and we start to have these conversations between adults and between adults and children uh, about things that really matter to us, things both happening within our own families and things that happens around our families in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you think that it's given, it's given adults the opportunity to really think about their place in something bigger and how that, not only their place, but how you communicate that if you are a caregiver, particularly to a young child. I think that it, it's caused many of us to come face to face with that, that it's hard to ignore um, the, the global events right now, that we are forced to see ourselves as more than just one thing and as more than just one neighborhood, and that continues to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would hope it's something that we're communicating with our children, too, 
Mm. and empowering our children to see that and to see the situation around them as um, really, yes, difficult and challenging, but an opportunity to learn and to grow. Um, you know, one thing that Jinlei and I have, have done a few talks recently where we've evoked the um, the notion of the the closed door and open window uh, metaphor mm -hmm. that you know I think has been attributed to different religious traditions, but Jinlei uh, came across it recently in Helen Keller's memoir, correct, Jinlei? And so it's you know the, along the lines of that when one door closes, another opens. But sometimes for so long we stare at the closed door that we don't see what has opened for us. Mm. And while we can stare at the closed door of all the things that we cannot do right now, there are a lot of open doors of things that we certainly can do. And I think those conversations with children are things that caregivers can continue to have and continue to do regardless of the circumstances around us, that we can use those circumstances to drive conversation to create opportunities for those conversations to happen in real ways mm -hmm. that help to comfort our children, but also help to empower them to keep pushing for those conversations and continue to have them even after maybe the world around us settles a bit. Mm -hmm. So can we explore that a little bit? What are some of those open windows now? Well, I think that Open windows are probably different for just about every family and person and educator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with with physical distancing, we've seen that as a literal closed door for many of us. Mm -hmm. um, but it does give the opportunity for us to think about what it means to be more intentional about connecting with one another. Um, I have missed my just spur of the moment conversations with colleagues walking through the halls, and I found that now we need to be a little bit more intentional about what it means to connect and helping our children to be intentional in those connections as well. And that's something that can live on mm -hmm. as we you know, become to, you know, more physically close to one another. Um, we can continue to be intentional around those connections and those opportunities for conversations. Um, I also think that one of those uh, windows that have been opened is we have a lot more time to spend with one another. Um, across the last eight months, and that it is different in different forms, and we're you know we have different forms of spending time with one another, and using our moments intentionally in the best ways that we can, doing what we can with what we have around the challenges of today, um, and in all of the you know the global pandemic, global anti-racism, to to really plant the seeds of those continued conversations. I. One of the things that I was have been thinking about is, you know, when um, Dana and I were both are teachers, <laughs> and uh, and we teach about human interaction, so we love being with people. And uh, ever since March, for the students in our own classrooms, as well as the many professional audiences that we interact with, we have been interacting with everybody like this, right, uh, over a screen. And initially, I just I, I was exactly, I think, what that quote was saying. I just keep staring at the closed door, right? I, I keep mm -hmm. just lamenting how this is different from being in person and how much I miss being in person and, and how, you know, lessons and workshops and speeches, none of them feels nearly as good or effective over the screen. So I was just, you know, I was obsessed about that for a few months. <laughs> and, and then... I think at some point, I think, you know, maybe it's Helen Keller, right? Who just reminded me, wait a minute, just look. Like, not 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 that the window is a replacement for the door, mm -hmm. but that the window offers an opening, right? It doesn't replace it. Like this online thing is never gonna replace the person face-to-face -face thing. But but what opportunity exists over here? And and one of the things I know that has helped me to grow as a teacher is, is actually, it turns out it's the same thing that we try to do with the simple interactions work with everyone who serves children. We, we, we have a saying in our work is that we like to help people to do intentionally what they already do intuitively. 
Mm-hmm. So there's a lot about these human interactions. Like if I'm in person with a group of students and one of the students raised their hand and says something really interesting, and I'm going to walk towards the students, I'm going to lean in. Like I do all of that intuitively, right? I wanted to show the students like, oh, that is so great. So how do we do that when we're on a flat screen, right? So all of a sudden, something that I used to do intuitively, now I have to think about doing it intentionally, right? How do I help that student on a Zoom screen that appears only as a tiny little thumbnail, right? How, how do I convey to that student that I heard you, like I, I totally see you and, and I wanna hear more what you have to say. Mm-hmm. And, and that isn't easy, but I think if we think like that, I feel like as, at least for, for me as a teacher, I feel like I'm growing. I'm, 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 I'm starting to think about all the things that I took for granted in teaching and in my interaction with students and, and how I can find the windows for it, uh, even if it doesn't replace it, but at least it's a window and, and, and it allows us to connect um, in a new way. Mm-hmm. And so thinking about thinking about being more intentional to connect with your practice, first of all, seeing the art of teaching and facilitating as a practice, right? I think that's a language pivot that your collective work moves us towards in a way that I deeply appreciate. Two is this idea of um, that forced or not closer stitching of our emotional intelligence to one another. Um, and to ourselves, right, taking us back into self-examination. If we think about a world where that is becoming uh, closer to us in practice, closer to our everyday lived experience, what might teacher preparation programs look like? What might teaching look like moving forward? My hope, um, and this is what we're doing in our own classrooms, preparing education caters of the future is that we begin to think about teaching both in the preparation of teachers as well as in the craft or the practice of teachers. We think about that all with a relational lens. And by that I mean, and it's it's one of our favorite things coming from Fred Rogers, that, that, that each of us learn and grow best through relationships. Mm-hmm. That, that when we learn, we're in relationship with each other, whether they're peers or teachers or even characters in a book. <laughs> when you know, people build kind of heartfelt relationships with even people that they can't touch and cannot see. Um, if we start to understand our learning and development in the context of relationships, then there isn't that divided world of here are a bunch of content and cognitive skills. And when you're done with that, let me give you a couple of games where you can work on your social emotional skills. And then we're going to go on to that. I think when you're in a relationship with another person who's invested in your learning, who's also learning, then all of a sudden, the learning of the content, the cognitive development and the social emotional development you can no longer separate them. They become like the little strands that weave together to make a tight rope. Like like when you look at that rope, yeah, you can see the strands, but the strength of the rope comes from the weaving together. It's not these individual isolated strands. So Jim what I think I I hear you saying is that it, it means that relationships are not just a means to an end. That relationships are both a means and an end and that building relationships in teaching is not just another thing that we do, but it becomes the fabric of everything that we do. That you're right, I like the the concept of weaving um, because that's, that's what relationships do. They bring that all together in a way that is congruent and cohesive and I, I think when I when I think of the future of teaching and learning, I think that that relational aspect is so important for our children, but it is so very, very important for our educators as well, mm-hmm. that they are feeling the power of their relationships peer to peer, to supervisors, and that they're having that same space 
of relational based learning and growing as they you know, craft their practice and their art of teaching. Um, it's the idea of what do we do to help the helpers in this process. It's we give them the same environment that they are giving to children, one that is full of relationships and one that allows for struggle and one that allows for mistakes and growth from that, but that is really woven together by relationships. Uh, you know, Jinlay and I talk very often about how we can't expect to make this lasting impact on children if we aren't thinking about the relational needs of the adults who are doing that work also. And that they have to be given that same respect and that same place to have relationships and grow from that place, just as children. That when, when Fred Rogers said that it's through relationships that we grow best and learn best, that wasn't just for children. That that's for all of us as we extend across humanity, that we learn best and grow best in those relational spaces. Mm -hmm. I was pausing for, for June Lay, but the one of the things that that makes me wonder is a wonder that I have uh, almost every single day doing this work is that really puts into question the negotiation of power holding particularly, I might argue, in schools, right? We're in highly academic spaces. And I wonder, I wonder what it looks like on a systems level, right? When we position relationships in this way, right? Because as there's a comment, I'm not sure that if, you, if folks can see it, I'll put it up around this idea that as we move to virtual instruction, we're moving towards more free choice learning and that these classical classroom management techniques become unmoored. And I would go even into a more provocative space of saying power management, right? Not just classroom management, behavior management, so on and so forth. Part of my comment is like bundled up into what we discussed around the song, what do you do with the mad that you feel? But they're, but they're also a little bit separate. <laughs> So we have a, a, a question that we ask um, in some of our professional learning spaces that really, you know, it, it makes that area of relationships, the foundation and what we would call the essential ingredient or the active ingredient of any type of child serving space or youth serving space. And that question is, how does, and you insert what it is, if it's a practice, a program, a policy, but how does it serve to encourage, enrich, and empower human relationships around children, youth, families, helpers? Mm. And if we can ask ourselves that question about uh, the smallest decisions to the biggest decisions that we're making, inherently, we're sharing power because we are forced to think about how we promote relationships that are humanizing, promote relationships that are developmental, promote relationships that encourage learning and growing. And if we can answer that question about the decisions that we're making, mm -hmm. then right there is an activity in sharing that power and creating relational spaces where we know that children and adults within those spaces have the opportunity to learn and to grow together. Mm -hmm. You know, Ani, you mentioned at the end kind of um, this classical Fred song, what do you do with the mad that you feel? Um, in the context of what Dana was saying, I think the way we ask that question about, you know, what is it that you're doing to strengthen these human relationships? I'll rephrase kind of the song as like, what do you do with the power that mm -hmm. you have? Um, and, um, and that, you know, children have the power of choice if we give them the choice. So we want to help them to do something with that power. Teachers have the power of often setting the agenda or at least creating a structure where children can choose as well as to follow. The principals have power, community leaders have power. Um, in our work, we have opportunities to speak with teachers, with social workers, with principals, administrators, state officials, even elected leaders. And uh, at least for us, we feel so strongly that no matter 
which audience that we're speaking with, we want to ask the exact same question. Um, and, and embedded in this question is, you know, what is it that you can do with the power that you have to encourage, enrich, and empower the human relationships mm -hmm. around the child, around the family, around the youth, around communities, around neighborhoods. Um, and, and I think having these essential qu questions, not as a self-reflection, but as a guidepost for collective action um, is possibly one way, right? That we can work from many different centers of power. We can work from many different levels of edu educational or social systems, but somehow collectively we, we, we can help to move our community uh, in the same humanizing direction um, that we so hope for. The irony that I would like to point out here is that some, sometimes, often, when I look at systems level policy and power brokering and relationship, is that we're so distanced, we've become so distanced in, from industrialization that being in a human relationship centered system of governance, of teaching and learning, almost feels as if it's a new or innovative idea. I don't know if you feel that way. <laughs> it, it can certainly seem that way. Mm -hmm. um, we like to think of it a little more as a reminder um, so that every you know person throughout history, whether whatever part of the system that they're in, uh, they've been a part of these relationships at some point. That there have been simple, small moments and big moments that have touched their life and that have influenced the way that they learn and grow. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it, it's a, a subtle reminder of how things may have been, but how things still can be. Um, that if we get distanced from a space that feels relational, that there's still a road back to that space. And it starts with as Jin Lee said, you know, thinking about our ability in, in collective situations to make decisions that continue to focus on the importance of those relationships and interactions. And I think it just reminded me kind of, isn't the feel, uh, the takeaway from Fred Rogers program very much about reminding us of who we are? Even those, I didn't, but it, it, the many people who have grown up with the neighborhood, um, when they found Fred Rogers again, when they're parents or when they're in their 30s and 40s, they're not just remembering a children's program. <laughs> they're being reminded right, of all those things that they value so much. Um, and rarely do Fred you know, come onto the program to say, here's something you don't know, let me tell you. <laughs> Right, it's just, I mean, he usually comes and goes. Have you ever wondered? Right? And then, then he will follow whatever that's with that. But, but the the idea is, I think Fred really believed there wasn't anything that you don't already know at some point in your growing, in your awareness, and and often it takes a prod from the outside or a a, a reflection from the inside or a friendship or an encouragement. Um, to remind you, I guess, in Fred's world, of your self-worth, of, of, of mm -hmm. the fact that, that you and every person in the world have something worth giving. Based on all of that, what might the far horizon of teaching and learning look like, in your opinion? Knowing that there are many possibilities, you can take us through as many of those possibilities as you like, as long as we end with your preferred possible possibility. Hmm. Uh, that's a that's a that's a tough question to end with, Ani. Um, I, I think, oh my goodness, the possibilities. But you know, we we think about these spaces in in every moment of what we do, and. When I say these spaces, any type of developmental setting where there's learning and growing, not 
um, not just the the spaces conventionally thought of, but you know we have done work with um, the crossing guards across the city of Pittsburgh, who are taking moments as they cross children and families from one side of the street to the other to have these developmental moments. And when I think of learning and growing and thinking and wondering in the future, it takes place in all of those spaces but it's also making sure that relationships and those touch points of relationships are taking place in all of those spaces also. That we don't turn off our relational lens when we leave our classrooms or when we leave intentional learning spaces, but that we take that out into our communities to create those experiences and create those opportunities uh, across every setting where we enter. And I think that when we reflect upon, if we go back to those big six that we talked about earlier, um, they are still so very uh, important today. And even though that was, you know, Fred wrote those in 1983, um, this is one of those situations where Fred, I think, um, you know, he when he wrote those, he meant them to be something that were, were universal and timeless. Um, and it's, you know, when we think of the, the many outside changes in our world, the circumstances we're facing today, whatever challenges come next, that those six things still focus in on what it means to serve the inner needs of humans, of children, of adults, and that those six things happen best through relationships. They happen best through intentional interactions where we work toward the learning and growing of everybody in that space. Dana, just to just to voice it one more time, because we know that repetition is really helpful. Can you name all six one more time for me? You're testing my memory, but yes, I can. So <laughs> the six things. First is a sense of self-worth. Second is a sense of trust. Third is curiosity. Fourth is the capacity to look and listen carefully. Fifth is the capacity for play. And sixth is times of solitude. Thank you. I know that there are folks who are listening right now who very much appreciate that. Sure. I think I think that's beautifully put. And I think the only thing I wanted to add to that is these six things, right? When you think about it, it's very different than, for example, a set of academic standards or a, a, a list of so-called 21st century skills or whatever it is. Um, and I think, I hope, uh, that as we move together in education, as we move together to think about all the ways that promote human learning and growing and human development, mm -hmm. that we set the goal, I think, in the way that I understood Fred set the goal, which is that, that this is really about building better human beings, or Fred would call growing human beings. And being a good human being isn't just about accumulating a bunch of skills or knowledge or credentials and degrees and status symbols and so on. But ultimately, it's this idea, what do you do with all those things that you have? Mm. What do you do with the power that comes with all the things you have, the power of knowledge, the power of credentials and so on? And I think in Fred's neighborhood, as well as in the world as we headed into now, I think part of being a human being is to be in better relationships, not only with other human beings, that's a start, but with our environment, with human beings who don't live anywhere near our neighborhoods, whose languages and skin colors and cultural traditions are quite different from ours. I think part of being a better human being and all those things, when you think about a sense of self-worth and trust and the capacity to be able to look and listen to people carefully, all these are attributes not of a first grader only or a high schooler or a college student, but 
decent, good human beings. And I'm just going to, I'm going to read off one of my favorite Fred quotes. This came very, very early on, I think in the early 70s when he just started the national programming and, and he was making this distinction. And he says that, how do we help people realize that what matters even more than the adult symbols? And so by that, he was talking about, you know, children learning alphabets and numbers and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, what, how do we help people realize that what matters more than the superimposition of these adult symbols is how a person's inner life finally puts together the alphabet and the numbers of his outer life. What really matters is whether a person uses the alphabet for the declaration of war or the description of a sunrise, or whether a person uses the numbers for the final count at Buchenwald, which is a Nazi concentration camp, or the specifics of a brand new bridge. And I think of bridge as the ultimate metaphor about building relationships, building bridges between people, between communities and neighborhoods. And that these attributes that Dana listed, right? These are the attributes that allow us to be better human beings. And, and, and I think in Fred's terms, there's nothing more glorious than the enterprise of growing human beings. I wanted to create space for everyone to let that settle. And I've had the great honor to really think about time very deeply over the last several months in relationship and in conversation with brilliant minds such as yourself. And I love the idea of thinking about those futures through all of those lenses in relationship to each other. I think both of you put that into a very poetic space for me that makes me think about the possibilities of the future being very quantum, right? And um, adaptable, right? <laughs> Particularly when we think about choice uh, as we grow our ability to build our own alphabet and say our own alphabet out loud and to whom and where and in what environment is a very, these are very powerful thoughts that I will, I will think about in, in the near future and in the far future. I'm sure I think that will stay with me for a long time. Dana and Junle, do you have closing thoughts or closing ideas or recommendations for all of the listeners who spent the last hour with us? Junle, why don't you start? I'm gonna just return to the thought. It's actually Dana reminded me of this over very big early on in the global pandemic. I was, you know, we often talked about every human interaction can either be humanizing and dehumanizing. And I remember we were having this conversation um, in preparing for a workshop and and we have this joke that between the two of us, when we have conversations, I, I often go for the theoretical, even when there are practical challenges in front of us. And and and, and so I was um, asking, you know, well, okay, so what is the practical action that comes from something like every interaction can be either humanizing or dehumanizing? And, and Dana reminded me of Fred's idea that each, and every one of us is more than just one thing. And I think that has helped me so much, I think, in the times since then. Um, I think all of us uh, who are conscientious about the future of our communities and our country struggled during the last few months about what can I do? Like, is there anything that I can do that makes a difference? And I think the question how am I, like each one of us, how am I more than just one thing? Right? And that question seemed to be 
to be able to make the difference between staring at closed doors and looking for open windows. Um, and, and, and if we think of ourselves more than just our professional title, uh, if we think of ourselves more than just our academic preparation, um, if we think of, our, of, of ourselves more than the particular roles we have been asked to play, I think we gradually start to discover that, yes, we are more than one thing. And if we know we're more than one thing, then the next step is we know there's more than one way in which we can show up in the world, that we can make the interactions with us and around us be become humanizing ones as opposed to dehumanizing ones. I think the, the looking for more than just one thing um, goes even further and it becomes the, the real foundation of what it means to show empathy to one another and to be truly kind to one another. Uh, when we think about Fred Rogers, instantly we think of this idea of kindness that seems to be synonymous with, with Fred. And kindness takes on um, much deeper meaning when we think of it in terms of looking at others as more than just one thing. That the root of the word kind is kin, which means family, neighbor, close companion. And so to be truly kind to someone moves beyond just superficial niceties to really look at another person with empathy and compassion, to acknowledge that they are more than just one thing, that we are more than just one thing, and to, to truly um, exhibit that kindness to your neighbors means to keep that as a reminder all the time in our interactions and our connections with one another. Well, I hope that everyone on the line and who will be listening to this in our possible futures joins me in expressing deepest gratitude and thanks. Uh, I feel better after this conversation then perhaps even the excitement and the joy I felt coming into that, that is a gift and thank you. And also as always, thank all of you who have listened today, who have continued to listen. Um, and as always, I hope you know that um, I, I am at your service and the Remake Learning Network is at your service. Once more, please join me in expressing deep gratitude to Dr. Lee and Dr. Winters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ani. Thank, Thank you, you Ani. And we're going to sign off our live cast. Thank you. Please join us for our grand finale next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You won't want to miss it. So thank you, everyone.